Good afternoon, eCognition folks, and welcome to the last eCognition webinar of 2020. Uh, I've got a really great topic today, and I'm, I'm very excited to have Jarlath O'Neill Dunn from the University of Vermont as our guest speaker. Uh, we're going to be looking at data fusion approaches to tree canopy change detection. Uh, I'm combining two aspects of e-cognition that I really like. First of all, data fusion uh, and then change detection. And we'll jump right into the presentation. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Jarlath is a much better public speaker than I am. So I'll give you just a brief rundown for those of you that might be new uh, to our Trimble e-cognition uh, software, on what this is. And then I'm going to hand over to uh, Jarlath and he'll talk about uh, data fusion and a tree canopy change detection in, in Work he has been doing with eCognition um, over the years. And then we'll be uh, doing some question and answer. Before we get uh, things kicked off, you are all in listen only mode. That's intentional. Uh, if you would like to interact with us, please use the questions dialogue. We'll be fielding questions throughout the webinar. Uh, we also have a question and answer session after the webinar, but please uh, submit your questions ahead of time so we can queue those up and, and make the most of the question and answer time that we do have. Um, furthermore, the webinar will be recorded and we will make this available on our YouTube channel, eCognition TV, for example, after, after the webinar. So if you miss something, don't worry. Uh, you'll be receiving the recording anyway by registering and you can also uh, view it on eCognition TV afterwards. All right, so just hit us up with those questions anytime and uh, we'll, we'll get around to answering those. All right. Thank you for attending today. My name is Keith Peterson. I'm the product manager for Trimble eCognition. And um, like I said, we have a, a wonderful guest speaker, but before that, I uh, just want to run you through the idea of eCognition. It's about transforming our geospatial data into information. We're taking those various data layers, those inputs that we have, we're replacing that manual interpretation process by utilizing the automated tools that eCognition uh, contains. So doing information extraction, change detection, object recognition in an automated way to try and create these information products, something like a land cover map, impervious surface maps, or locating individual trees as Jarlath is going to discuss uh, later on. To do this, we uh, have several really unique elements of eCognition, one being this concept of data fusion. I'm sure Jarlath is going to go into much detail here, so I don't want to take too much away from him. But you have the potential to combine your raster, point cloud, and vector data sets all within one project environment in eCognition and utilize the strengths of each of these data sets to create, say, that perfect description of the feature you're looking at. On top of this, uh, there's something that I, I talk about more and more recently, and this is method fusion. Within eCognition, you have access to different types of classification methodologies. You can look at knowledge-based, supervised classifications, unsupervised classifications. You have computer vision with things like template matching. And recently, you have access to deep learning uh, through the integration of Google TensorFlow libraries into eCognition. But the beauty is these can all be combined within your eCognition e rule set, you're not locked into one analysis approach. So you can take, uh, say, an initial deep learning classification and build on that using some of the real strengths of object-based image analysis in knowledge-based approaches. All of these different approaches can be combined and automated uh, within a seamless uh, rule set. So these are the, are the real strengths um, that we have to play on within eCognition. Like I said, I have a, a really great speaker today. I'm always excited uh, when Jarlath comes to present because uh, we go way back. Um, actually, Jarlath is from the University of Vermont, my alma mater, um, way back when. And um, we've known each other on and off uh, since then. And uh, he had really is bringing in 20 years, over 20 years of experience uh, with GIS and remote sensing. He is also the director of U the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Laboratory, or the SAL where uh, he's been really concentrating on the development of these object-based image analysis systems and particularly for automated feature extraction. Uh, his team at the SAO has generated uh, now over the years trillions of, of pixels worth of high resolution data from a variety of inputs. So getting towards this uh, topic of data fusion, aerial imagery, satellite imagery, and of course, uh, LIDAR data. 
All right. Their focus is on, um, on, been on urban uh, forestry planning, and I think we're going to see some great customer uh, use stories of that here today. And, and uh, also uh, along that line, a water quality monitoring and modeling. And in, in addition to all this work, um, really wonder where he finds the time, um, he also teaches introductory and advanced courses in GIS and remote sensing at the university. And uh, that being said, I am going to hand the mic over now or the computer screen over uh, to Jarla and he will uh, take on the rest of the presentation and you'll hear from me at the end. So please sit back, enjoy. Uh, I know I will enjoy this presentation and uh, Jarla, the, uh, the screen is yours. Awesome, hey, thanks Keith and thanks to everyone for joining. Great to be uh, with all of you. Keith, how's my screen sharing up, okay? Looks like it. All right, folks. So I'd like to get into this topic of tree canopy mapping and not just tree canopy, but tracking the change over time. And this has grown out of our urban forestry work in which we've sought to help cities who are dealing with so many different issues, stormwater runoff, environmental equity and justice, and things like you see here, the urban heat island. And initially our work focused very much on taking remotely sensed data, the imagery and the LIDAR, and turning into high resolution land cover maps. Using this information, communities were then able to figure out not only how much tree canopy they had, so they could set tree canopy goals, but where they could plant trees. And major cities such as New York, which has a 1 million tree goal, which they achieved, that was based on some of the work that we did using e-cognition as the foundation for the mapping. As these cities have embarked on these tree canopy planting initiatives, the question they're coming to us now is how has our tree canopy changed over time? And this is a very, very, very challenging question to answer, especially when you're helping cities who don't have massive budgets to go out and acquire the ideal remotely sensed data. And typically our products end up looking like this, in which we have disparate data sets. So we could have imagery, such as what you see here from two time periods, and LIDAR from two time periods. These are often acquired from different sensors using different platforms by different vendors with different processing specifications. And from this, what we've been doing is building automated routines within eCognition to thereby map the gain, loss, and then the no change in tree canopy. And so our goal here is not to just map tree canopy from two, from two time periods and difference them, but to actually come up with accurate and verifiable information that communities can understand how their tree canopy has changed over time. And this is absolutely crucial if they want to make foundational decisions going forward on their urban forest. So I've mentioned some of the challenges and these really fall into these four categories. We've got lots and lots of data and it's not just imagery and LIDAR, we've got vector data. It's all been acquired at different times. Typically we've got LIDAR from one date and then imagery from two dates, sometimes imagery from two dates and LIDAR from two dates. We run into all these different situations. We've also got inconsistent resolutions, everything from the LIDAR having different point spacings to the imagery having different pixel resolutions. And then on top of that, we've got issues with the data themselves, particularly the imagery where we've got parallax, so the trees are leaning different ways. And you can imagine the challenge of deciding, has this tree here really changed or is it just differences in the lean of the tree in the imagery. And then finally, we're working with data in a number of different formats, everything from point clouds to rasters to vector data. And really it's difficult for us to find a solution out there that helps us handle all of these things uh, like eCognition does. And I'm gonna give you insights into our workflow. And this is a production mapping workflow. So our goal here isn't necessarily just automating things. It's generating high quality products. And so eCognition is the foundation of that, but also give you insights into how we interject humans and especially manual editing into the process. And so it all starts with vector preparation. So we've got imagery, LIDAR data, and then vector data. And we've got some scripts and routines that help us handle those, mosaicing the imagery, 
Oftentimes we'll do things like normalize the point clouds and generate some rasters. And this isn't designed just for e-cognition. This is also so the the organ or the uh, individuals that are doing the manual editing have the foundational data sets to work with too outside of e-cognition. And then our feature extraction is a coupled approach. We're using automation to the fullest extent possible. And then we're bringing in manual interpretation to ensure quality and accuracy. And then at the end, we're getting to our analytics, really the products that go to the end users. And when we're working with these cities, they don't care about object-based image analysis. They don't care about data fusion. They care about information from which they can make decisions going forward. So our approach with an e-cognition, and I think what makes it unique, is first of all, we use customized import routines to generate individual projects based on tiled LIDAR data. So typically the LIDAR data, the point clouds, is the foundational data set for our feature extraction. From that, within our rule set, and that's over to the right there, the key components of our rule set, one is loading data. The fact that within our rule set, we can bring in other data sets as part of the loading process. And this really makes things efficient in terms of how we can go out and grab data sets. And we particularly like the fact that if we're working with say a thousand LiDAR tiles, we can have image mosaics and eCognition will just go out and clip on the fly and bring in the imagery to precisely match that point cloud. We then do classification um, using a variety of algorithms, but expert systems as we'll talk through it are still uh, really one of our favorites for data fusion. Then refinement, and I think this is where eCognition really excels in terms of everything from its morphology and the broad array of object features that we can classify and refine things with, and then kicking it out, getting it into the hands of the editors so that they can improve upon us. And our goal is to use eCognition to get us 90, 95%, maybe 98% of the way towards a final product. So let's take a look at that, how we do this for tree canopy change. And this is something that we've refined over time. And our workflow that I'm showing you here isn't necessarily based on what eCognition can do. It's often based on what we find our manual interpreters who have to go through and check all the data before it goes out for analytics, how they work best. So typically when we're working with two time periods of data, we'll call it T1 and T2, we'll have start with extracting tree canopy for T2. The reason being is this second time period probably has the best available data, the highest resolution, the highest, the highest point density LIDAR data. We'll then go in and manually edit that time period two tree canopy. We'll then bring in the time period one data, reload it into eCognition, the edited tree canopy, and then derive change and then manually edit that change. Okay, so this is a somewhat iterative process. Sure, we could do tree canopy change right up front, but we found it's easier for the editors and it's more efficient and effective if they can focus on at least initially fixing the errors in one time period of data. And what we really love about eCognition is it gives us the flexibility to bring the data out and then bring the vector data back in. So let me walk you through the foundational part of this, which is extracting tree canopy for a single time period. So like I mentioned, our starting point are our LiDAR point clouds. You can see the elevation information on the left. And here we run a point cloud classification algorithm. So this particular example is for the city of Boston. And this was one of our worst case scenarios. And the reason was the worst case scenario is we had LIDAR and imagery from two time periods, but they were very, very different. Time period two was leaf on LIDAR. Time period one was leaf off LIDAR. Time period two had leaf off imagery and leaf on imagery. Time period one had only leaf on imagery. And then they had some vector data sets where, which were in various um, conditions. Some were really good, some were less than good, all had inherent flaws. And fortunately, through eCognition's routines, we're able to build expert systems to handle these. So as you can see that the classification, the point cloud classifier in this case, didn't do a great job in terms of classifying those points. And this is one of the nice things about eCognition is that we can accept the flaws in existing algorithms like point cloud classifiers. And we tried some outside of eCognition and inside eCognition. And the challenge was that Really, the point cloud classifiers didn't perform particularly well on this leaf on LIDAR data. And that's because there wasn't a lot of penetration of the tree canopy. And rather than get wrapped up in getting a very, very good point cloud classification, we decided to move on and take advantage 
the of the data fusion capabilities that eCognition has. So once we have those LiDAR tiles loaded in, and this was hundreds of tiles for the city of Boston, we then imported as part of the rule set the leaf on and leaf off data for this time period to the most recent time period. So you can see here, these data sets are very different. They're both four band, but one's leaf on, one's leaf off. And if you just look closely at some of the buildings here, you can see the leaf on imagery, not quite as high resolution, and the buildings have much, much more substantial lean there. The orthorectification is not nearly as good. And then we've got a leaf off imagery there, better orthorectification, but we still have issues of parallax there. And of course, we don't have those issues with the LIDAR data. So we've got rather substantial issues here, just in our remotely sensed data. We've got LIDAR, we've got leaf on and leaf off imagery, and there's no spatial agreement between these. We've also got LiDAR surface models, and what's great about eCognition, of course, is we can automate the routines of addressing and interpolating the data to generate DEMs, the ground surface, and then DSMs for the first returns. And we can also use these pixel-based routines to subtract layers. And what we love about eCognition is that we don't have to spend time generating hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes of data outside of eCognition that we're just gonna end up throwing away. So we can do this with inside our rule set using some of these layer arithmetic algorithms. And then at the end of the rule set, those data just get thrown away. So we've got a normalized digital surface model height above ground there on the left. We've got intensity over on the right, which we ended up not using. It was just not consistent enough across the area. And then we've got these vector data sets. So we've got the buildings, which as you see here, don't precisely align with the imagery. And if you look closely, you'll see that they're actually somewhat out of date. And over on the right there, we've got road edges. It would be great if they were polygons, but in this case, they were from an engineering diagram. So they were just lines. So we've got a lot of information here. None of it's perfect and none of it's agreeable. We can also derive various LiDAR data sets with any cognition, running our slope routines to generate slope. And this is really nice because we can see the tree canopy has much higher slope within there and also take the first minus last returns for the rasters, which also helps to highlight the tree canopy in certain areas. And then of course, we can do things that we may want to incorporate to improve our segmentation, which is running various ed edge detection filters. And we're doing all of these routines in eCognition prior to doing any segmentation and classification, just so we have a full data stack available to us with a very robust set of information. So initially we start with a simple multi-resolution segmentation, and I think probably we're all familiar with this, and some of you may have questions about, well, what thresholds did you use and this and that. In this particular case, we're making use of some of the edge layers, we're making use of the LiDAR surface models, and we're making use of the imagery all within the multi-resolution segmentation algorithm. We try to limit the amount of time we spend adjusting the parameters. We don't believe that any segmentation is ever perfect. We just need it to be good enough. And by good enough, we want our objects to be as small as necessary, but as large as possible, meaning that we don't want an object to contain more than one feature of interest, right? We don't want an object to contain both a building and a tree, but we may have an object that splits a tree into multiple different parts. After that, we do height partitioning. This is very simple using the multi-threshold segmentation algorithm. And all we're doing here is saying from that initial segmentation, go ahead and partition out all of those objects that are tall. And what you'll notice here is that we're using some very simple logic with an expert system. And throughout this, I'll be stressing the importance of expert systems in our case, because as we go from city to city and do this type of mapping, approaches such as deep learning really require us to generate more training samples. And it's not very efficient for us because these data sets are never consistent. So the deep learning algorithms, which are sensitive, to the input source data sets tend not to perform well. As opposed to our expert systems, we can often make tweaks here and there and use components of a previous rule set in order to make rapid progress in a new area. So very simple, we're just saying, let's go ahead and find those things that are tall. Um, from that, you can see here overlaid on top of the imagery, we've now got this whole mass of image objects here. Now, from this point in time, what we do is we take a stepwise approach to classification. The reason we take a stepwise approach to classification is twofold. One, it gives us transferability and that we can easily move our algorithms from one city to the next 
and not have to worry that they're so complex that we can't figure things out. The other thing is, is as we do iterations of our rule set and kick it out for review by the manual editors, if we receive feedback that something is wrong, we can go in and change individual parameters. So we want our rule sets to be easily digestible, and we do that using very simple and straightforward logic. So the first thing that we've done here is just trying to partition out those things that are likely tree canopy. And so the logic here is that with tree canopy, we expect there to be a large difference in the first and last return. So you can see the tree canopy highlighted there in green. And right now we're already over 90% accuracy, right? If we wanted to publish this in peer reviewed literature, we'd, we'd probably get by with it. We're doing a pretty good job. Cartographically though, we are so far from where we need to be, right? We can see that the edges of buildings are falsely classified. If you look in the road areas there, you can see that traffic lights are classified as trees. You can see that some trees, especially some of those smaller ones near the streets have not been classified correctly as tree canopy. So in a very short amount of time here, we've done an accurate classification, but it's not nearly accurate enough. And so I'd say probably about 2% of our time for rule set development gets us this far. And the next 98% of rule set development is making this look good enough. So, then we'll go in and we'll figure out how do we deal with the building. So we'll focus on those things that are very, very likely buildings. So in that first pass, it was likely tree canopy, and now it's likely buildings. Now we noticed here that the LIDAR data, the first and last returns, like I mentioned, because it was leaf on, wasn't ideal. So what we did is we started taking a look at the data and just using our traditional image interpretation tradecraft, and we found that actually the trees, the slope layer that we generated before was really meaningful. So on a sub-level, we found those areas that had very, very high concentrations or high relative areas of slope, and those that had not just a high average value, but a high relative area of slope were more likely trees, and those that had a very low area of slope generally were more buildings. And so you can see here by adding in this additional routine here, we further subdivided the tree canopy into more meaningful classes here, right? We're getting closer to our end state here. We've got the green is the tree canopy, that bluish purple color of the buildings. And then we have those orange. Those are still the pieces that we need to classify, all right? So then we went ahead here and we said, well, we found some errors here. We found some pieces of missed tree canopy. And so now we're gonna bring in NDVI. You're probably wondering why we didn't use NDVI early on. And this was due to the parallax in the imagery is that if we relied on NDVI instead of the LIDAR properties early on, we ended up with a lot of false tree canopy. However, in certain cases, particularly those trees that are wide out in the open, NDVI proved to be valuable, providing we did a LIDAR-based classification first. And I think this is what's really valuable about eCognition is we're not just throwing a deep learning algorithm at this and saying, use this entire data stack to classify the data. We can use all of the properties of that data stack, or we can go in and selectively just use the LIDAR imagery at a given time. And there you can see we've made some improvements. Still not perfect, you're gonna notice some errors, but we're getting closer. Now we begin the context-based refinement. Okay, so up until this point in time, I've probably spent about 15% of my time developing the rule set. And now the rest of this, the rest of the 85% here takes a lot of time. And we're making very small and incremental changes, but we're dealing with those issues that if this data set were to go out to stakeholders, they would be very upset with. And some of these are just the false trees within buildings. And thanks to eCognition's routines, where we have these context-based routines, such as relative border to, we can find and highlight what you see here in that um, magenta color, those areas that we think are falsely classified. Now we also have building vector data. Now the building vector data in this case wasn't perfect, but we did wanna make use of it. So we've done this initial building classification based on the LIDAR, and now we're gonna incorporate the vector-based buildings to do some refinement, especially to deal with some of this infrastructure like the heating and cooling units on top of these buildings. So we bring those buildings in at a sublevel, and then we can help to eliminate some of those things on top of buildings or adjacent to buildings that are unlikely to be tree canopy based on those vector objects. And so making use of an image object hierarchy here is another um, very powerful aspect of eCognition. Now we also wanted to use the vector buildings to help us identify possible errors. Particularly, we wanted to see 
in some cases where the tree canopy intersects the vector buildings, okay, because we did notice that we were falsely classifying some of the tree canopy, very small portion, but some of it into this building category, excuse me, some of the buildings into the tree canopy category. So we use those buildings on the sublevel to find those, and then we use these context-based routines, such as relative border to, or in some cases looking at the properties of the imagery and the LIDAR, to go ahead and refine things so we can narrow down. And you can see some of those areas between the left and the right there where we've made some corrections, okay? And then we're going into looking at those areas that don't have adjacent buildings there and further refining it. And now we get into the stage where really what's left here is mostly these tiny little sliver areas. And we make an awful lot of use of pixel-based object re uh, resizing routines. In these cases, what we're doing is we're growing out and then we're shrinking back in. And this sort of competitive growing between classes, such as the buildings and the tree canopy, allows us to intelligently resolve some of these remaining issues, those magenta areas that you see there. And by using these routines, which are simple and effective, we can grow back and forth and deal with some of these edge effects. And now we're getting even closer to our desired end state. Now, what we often find is we make all of this progress and then we get down into it and we're like, gosh, you know, there's still some obvious errors out there. And one of the things is after we did all these routines, we remerged the objects and we resegmented. And we did that to create larger objects because in some cases we were falsely classifying buildings as tree canopy and they were obviously very bright and had low NDVI. So by generating larger objects, much larger objects in our initial segmentation, we're able to find these. Now, as you can see here, some of this is tree canopy and some of these are errors. So we went ahead and did some additional classification there to deal with those. And because we're working with objects of different sizes, we can apply different routines than we did initially to identify those trees and those buildings. We do some more edge refinement after the fact there, once again, dialing down and refining our objects more and more, getting closer to the classification. And things were looking pretty good, as you see here on the left there. It's a pretty nice classification. The problem was we were picking up a lot of stuff in the streets, and the streets were really, really challenging. We had trees that were heavily shadowed by buildings and thus had very, very low NDVI values. And then at the same time, we had things like some of the cars and some of the utility poles and all this street infrastructure out there that resembled tree canopy in the LIDAR data. So a way that we were able to more intelligently refine that classification was to bring in these road edges. And these weren't polygons already, and it would have been time consuming in the standard GIS workflow to turn these into polygons. But one of the nice things about eCognition and the object-based approach is we're able to classify these road edges as polygons using some relatively simple routines based on segmentation and context-based classification. So using those polygons that we generated from the road edge data, we then could flag all of those tree canopy objects that were within the road, providing they met a certain size threshold. And then over on the right there, we only wanted to include those that we felt were a certain distance from the edge and not connected to other tree canopy, also those that didn't have the shape of tree canopy. So we're making use of the geometric information here. This gets at much of the light and utility line infrastructure, which tends to be linear, and also some of the other things like the trams and the cars and things like that. They tend not to have that round geometric shape. And here you can see is what it looks like after we've made use of the road corrections. Once again, really powerful here in that we're only bringing in these vector layers when we actually need them to make a decision. And then finally, we'll resegment the data at the, at the end. And the reason why we're doing a different segmentation routine at this point in time is we want the objects to be a little bit larger so that the editors can bring this into GIS software and they will just delete the tree canopy that is not valid. We will typically try to overshoot our classification for tree canopy with the reason being that it's generally more efficient to delete in an editing process than it is to create, okay? So we're doing manual editing, and then once that manual editing is complete, we're gonna bring that data back into eCognition, and we're gonna get a tree canopy change. As I mentioned before, the reason why we do manual editing at this phase is we found that it's easier and results in better output from the manual editing team if they simply focus initially on tree canopy from one time period rather than tree canopy change. 
So let's take a look at the data we're using for tree canopy change here. As I mentioned, the LIDAR data from time period one, you see over on the left there, was leaf off and it was at a lower resolution, less point density. And then over on the right there, higher point density and leaf on. So really, really different data from a LIDAR perspective. In addition, although I'm not displaying the imagery, the trees were leaning in different directions due to parallax. So a lot of, a lot of challenges there. Um, when we look at the difference between the NDSMs between those two time periods, and this is just different ways of displaying it in e-cognition. Over on the left there, you can see we're actually subtracting the NDSMs. So the ones with the higher values is more change. Over on the right there, we're just applying it to the color garden. So one of the other nice things about e-cognition is it just gives us great visual tools for inspecting our data, right? And we shouldn't dismiss the fact that quite often the best approach to feature extraction is just to understand our data and data exploration. And so we can see here, we're certainly picking up a lot of places in which the tree canopy has changed. And you can see that over on the right there, those magenta colors are clearly losses. But then we've also got this green area that shows up as gain. And if we go back to the previous slide here, the problem with the LIDAR being leaf off for time period one and these being deciduous species, in the majority of cases is that it's really underestimating the canopy. And so if we were to just do an NDSM difference, we'd be vastly overestimating the amount of tree canopy gain between these two time periods. And we'd also be underestimating in other cases, the amount of loss due to the differences in the quality of the data. Sure, ideally, if we had an unlimited budget, we would have done leaf on LIDAR between both time periods. But on our perspective, we're just the receiving group for the LIDAR. We did not do the specifications nor the classification for those data. So the first thing we do is bring in that tree canopy data from T2 that went through the manual corrections process. And we're gonna really zoom in here so you can see it on time period one versus time period two there, okay? And then we do our similar routine, like I showed you before, to get a tree canopy for time period one. And now we've got tree canopy for both time periods integrated into a single e-cognition workflow. Now we don't just wanna subtract these two, what we wanna do is intelligently combine them so that we can accurately identify the no change, the gain and loss, while at the same time overcoming the limitations that we find in the data. So over on the left there, you see the uh, start of the initial change. So the no change there is purple, the green is the, the green's the gain. Then over on the right here, you see us adding in the loss there. And we're zoomed in here and you can see that some things look a little bit funny overall, it's pretty good, but we clearly have some issues to address here, both respect to the accuracy of the mapping itself and also for the metho um, morphology, excuse me, of these features. So one of the things that we identified early on is we know that there were lots of false gaps in that leaf off LIDAR data from time period one. So this is where there's pixel-based object resizing routines over on the left there in step one. Okay, we begin to fill in those gaps. Over in two, we grow back in. Okay, so we're only retaining those things that have a high relative border to existing objects. And then in steps three, we begin to eliminate them. And then in step four, they're gone. So we, what we've done here is we filled in areas where we would have identified false change had we not used this routine. And there is really no science here. This is all just tradecraft looking at the data, right? And understanding our data. And I cannot stress how important it is just to spend minutes and minutes or really hours and hours panning through your data so that you understand the differences and limitations. Okay. So our tree canopy change was successful, but in our final review of the data, we noticed something really, really annoying. And that was these tiny little seam lines that you see here. So what we found out is just the way the LIDAR data had been tiled, that there were small differences, excuse me, very, very small gaps, okay? Less than a meter gap between the LIDAR tiles. As a result, when we were running our routines, we ended up identifying false change along these seam lines. This is another way in which eCognition saved us really days in manual edits by bringing the data back in and applying a seam line correction routine here. So in this case, we didn't even make use of the imagery of the LiDAR data. We're entirely basing this routine on morphological approaches, especially pixel-based object resizing routines with an e-cognition. And I'm not sure what I would do in my career without the pixel-based object resizing routines. So in step one there, you can see that's the gain, loss, and no change. No change in purple, 
loss in that orange color, green in the gain color. And you can see that stripe right through the middle there. That's the seam line being falsely classified as gain, okay? So in step two there, what we've done is we've grown or coated rather the unclassified objects into those gain objects that you see there. In step three, we've grown it out back a little bit. And then in step four, we've grown it out even a little more. So what we're doing is we're narrowing down those things that we think are these seam lines. And they're really, really tricky because they're long and thin, but there's also a lot of other things that are long and thin out there on the edges of canopy. So unless we do this pixel-based object resizing first, we don't actually get very good geometry that's representing these seam lines and they're not separated from the tree canopy. So let's go to steps five and six here. And here you can see we begin to narrow it down to where these blue areas over in step six there, those are the ones that we're primarily concerned with. And then we're gonna take it a step further using some additional pixel-based object resizing. And now we're getting really close to identifying those seam lines and then we can go ahead and remove them and end up with an accurate accounting of the data that minimizes the removal of tree canopy change that was successfully classified and at the same time addresses these annoying seam line issues that were only identifiable at a scale of one to 200. And so what products do we end up with? Well, we end up with tree canopy height, which is really, really valuable and incorporating e-cognition, we can take those objects and we can extract the height from the two time periods. This is, has tremendous value for decision makers because if you look at these two charts here, what you see, and these are in US units, so feet, what you see up top there is the height of loss for tree canopy. And you'll notice here that most of the loss in terms of the area is happening between trees that are perhaps 30 and 50 feet in height. And then when we go down and look at the no change in gain, we see that there's also a lot of gain happening in those categories. Why is this valuable to the decision makers? It lets them know that a lot of their trees are being removed during the time period where they're still gaining canopy, right? And so the power of e-cognition is not only that we're able to identify the change, it's then that we're able to go ahead and generate those tree objects and attribute them with the LIDAR properties from both time periods. And we're able to do that using attributes such as quantiles, which are less sensitive to some of the extreme values within the LIDAR data itself, all right? And this is very difficult stuff to do using traditional LIDAR packages, we found. Other things that we can do using eCognition's context-based routines and the fact that objects have an inherent topology to them is we can identify the types of gains and losses out there. So what gains are connected to existing tree canopy, meaning that it's growth, what gains are unconnected, meaning that it's newly planted trees, and the same things with loss. What losses are connected, okay, meaning that it's a portion of sort of a forested stand that's being removed as opposed to an individual tree. And this also gives the communities an understanding about how they're losing tree canopy. In this particular case for Boston, we can see that most of the gains come from tree canopy growth from existing stands, and most of the losses are also breaking up those connected forest patches. Now, bring this all together into GIS, we can end up then with surface temperature maps, which the city had already, and then we can take a look at our relative tree canopy change. And now we're way, way zoomed out here, but if we zoom back and forth between these two, what's interesting here is you can see the gains in the city, the places where a tree canopy has gained the most relative from time period one to time period two are actually the hottest areas. And this is very encouraging. It means their tree planting efforts are paying off. So what are some of the conclusions and takeaways here? And so we know there's all this wonderful technology out there with AI and deep learning and TensorFlow, but we find that expert systems still have a huge role to play, especially in change detection. We can intelligently incorporate logic from our data discovery into rule sets. In addition, expert systems allow us to reuse routines in ways that would be very, very difficult for deep learning because they can be made into these stepwise approaches that are less sensitive and more flexible to the underlying data structure. And because they're expert systems, we don't need to spend a lot of time generating training data. Data fusion is still key, and hopefully one of the things you took away from this example here is how we selectively use the input data sets. Imagery 
in terms of doing tree canopy change detection in urban areas tends to not be very effective due to both parallax and lighting conditions, but it can be very useful in certain cases, providing we've done the majority of the feature extraction based on the LIDAR data. You also saw how we incorporated some data such as road edges, which are simple lines, and using eCognition's object-based and data fusion approaches, use them to address errors in the data. And then finally, it's people in the loop here, right? Our goal was not to build simply a routine that did tree canopy change in an automated fashion. Our goal here was getting very, very accurate information on tree canopy. And in order to do that, we developed routines that offer an initial classification. It may go out for editing, and then we'll bring it back into eCognition and continue the processing and the workflow behind that. So really thinking through your workflow and deciding when and where you want to bring humans into the loop to do things like make those corrections. I'll throw my contact information up here. I'll just add that if you go to learn.uvm.edu or look into a release um, sometime, probably mid 2021 online course, it'll focus on sort of these data fusion um, uh, techniques. And there's my contact information. Of course, you can also find me on the eCognition forum. So Keith, with that, I'll turn it over back to you and just uh, see what sort of questions and comments we have. Great, Joe. Thank you very much. I'm just going to get my uh, screen pop back up here. Just a moment on this. Mm. Yeah, folks, please, um, if you have uh, questions, uh, this is a great time to to submit them. We'll be around for for a little bit longer here. Um, a few questions did come in, uh, Jolith. Um, one is um, so in your your uh, study, you've been using uh, point clouds from from lidar. Have you also considered, uh, say, from other sources, maybe photogrammetry? If so, um, how would uh, this compare? Uh, it may be a pro contra on use of a lidar versus a, a photogrammetric uh, point cloud source. Yeah, that, thanks, Keith, and thanks for who asked that question. We did have a project where we had lidar from one time period and photogrammetric point clouds from the other time period. Um, obviously, photogrammetric point clouds, if you use them in urban areas, um, the more heterogeneous the landscape becomes, the yes, less useful, I would say, those point clouds are. They become very, very, very noisy. But thanks to eCognition, we're able to incorporate them really where they sort of helped our workflow. And in this case, it was identifying um, areas where there were substantial changes, such as construction, which helped to then cue our rule set to examine those particular areas for tree canopy change. So yes, we have used them. And I think the nice part, once again, of eCognition is we can decide when we want to incorporate them into the classification process with expert systems. And that's still where I think the expert systems tend to work well as compared to some of the sort of training-based approaches, the, either the supervised classifications or the deep learning approaches, because you can make them less sensitive to the anomalies by using some of your expert knowledge to address those places where you know it's weak. Great, we have a couple of other questions that are pouring in now uh, and also a lot of it uh, in terms of your um, point cloud. Uh, one here is uh, a question about uh, whether you have to rectify the different uh, dates of LIDAR data so that they, they match. So one of the things that we do not try to address is the fact that there are inherent issues with these data sets. And one could spend weeks, maybe months, trying to fix data, right? So we've got imagery with parallax, we've got LIDAR data acquired from different time periods, and we've spent, we've, we've spent lots and lots of time trying to fix those, and we fix an issue in one location, and then it becomes worse in another. And what we really like about the e-cognition approach is we're able to use through the rule sets and the algorithms, we're able to use the data intelligently so we can capitalize on its strengths and then minimize its weaknesses. And so I'd really encourage people, while you definitely want to spend some time correcting issues with your data, if they're highly flawed, if someone's already orthorectified that imagery and it's coming from the vendor, there's very, very little that you're going to be able to do to fix it up. Okay, there's very little chance that your georeferencing is going to improve it. The same thing if you've got parallax in the imagery. There's almost nothing you can do, especially if you're working with an orthorectified product. What you do want to try to do is make use of that data intelligently in rule sets by, for example, 
handling dark areas using a different routine. So I mentioned the problem with shadows. And when we have areas that are very dark within an image, we'll rely entirely on the LIDAR data within those areas for future extraction, as opposed to areas that are bright, we'll often make use of both the LIDAR and the imagery. So we have branching routines there that help us to handle those issues. Great. Another question came in here uh, in terms of uh, how do you um, assess or how can you how can you be sure that uh, to the degree of say you're uh, over or maybe underestimating uh, the change in, in the analysis? Yeah, th this is a great question because the thing is we don't have any ground truth, right? We've got all these different data sets, none of which agree precisely with each other. And it's not like anyone has information on the ground where someone has gone in and used perhaps a terrestrial LIDAR scanner and maybe a drone with a LIDAR scanner to generate reference data for these trees. So a lot of this is really looking at it from the perspective of the data and deciding this change here is what we're picking up real or do we think it's due to issues in the data? And this is where I think we still need to make sure that we have domain expertise and that we understand what it is that we're mapping. In addition, our community partners are really, really helpful. So when we identify these areas of change, we'll send the data out to them. And ideally, they can give us some places where they say, yep, that's absolutely true. We know trees were being removed there. So in one case, we're identifying a lot of tree canopy loss between an, within a natural area. And we we're very concerned that perhaps that was due to the LIDAR date and time period one being leaf off and not being very, very detailed. But our community partners were able to tell us in that case that yes, they remember a storm coming through that area. And indeed, lots of tree canopy had been removed. Um, using eCognition's routines, and especially the morphology and all the size that we have in objects, what's really nice is we can tease out those areas where the loss is of a substantial size and certain shape, which helps us differentiate between the actual loss versus quite often what we see, which is just, the LIDAR under leaf off conditions penetrating through the um, the structure of the forest. On, on, on that note, an, another question came in here regarding the data that you used uh, in this particular um, example. And it, they're just asking what resolution, say imagery, and maybe what, um, I guess, well, hard to say what resolution uh, LIDAR, but uh, maybe how many returns were you getting uh, per yeah. square meter, for instance, on, on the LIDAR? Um, data sets that you were provided in this. In this yeah, yeah. And, I, and I really like how you said there, Keith, you were provided, because that's the thing, we were provided with these, right? We didn't, we didn't have a choice here, right? And so mm. uh, in the imagery, uh, the imagery ranged from a resolution of one meter down to a quarter meter. So the leaf on imagery was one meter, the leaf off uh, imagery was a quarter meter. Uh, on the LIDAR data, um, in terms of points per square meter, the uh, LIDAR from time period one was, uh, depending on the location, around um, uh, two to four points per square meter, and the second one was getting more towards six to 10 per square meter. Uh, the first LIDAR data set, although these all had um, uh, four returns at a minimum, uh, the second LIDAR data set, in some cases, they were getting more returns, but because it was leaf on, we we're actually getting much worse penetration of the tree canopy than we were getting in the time period one data set. So really, really different um, data sets here. And, uh, and in addition, like I showed, we had lots of issues with parallax, particularly among the taller buildings. I, I think it, it, it's excellent because when, when viewing this, for me, it was nice to see, well, this is a real world situation. Um, I, th I have a feeling a lot of people come into our webinars and they, they, they brush us off, ah, that's, you're working with perfect data, of course it's going to work perfectly. Um, we purposely go out and we try and get uh, real world data to, to work with, and oftentimes it does have that situation, like you pointed out, the resolutions, uh, there's a mismatch, you have more or less off nattier, um, LIDAR data sets uh, are, aren't, aren't always uh, cooperating with one another in terms of leaf on, leaf off, uh, or different years, different different qualities. Um, and I think that was a, one of the real things that, that, that I enjoyed listening to here was how the software can still be designed to be flexible enough uh, to handle that in, in the different situations. 
And yeah, Keith, I'll say it again that I'm really of the opinion that spend your time doing the classification and e-cognition. Don't spend your time trying to fix data sets that are probably beyond repair. Accept those limitations and march on. And I think with sometimes really basic logic and using those data where they're strong and then not using them where they're weak is the way to generate results. Mm. Yeah. And it leans into an, another question that came up. Uh, I can I can try and field this one. It, it looks at say some of the data fusion that's gone on. Uh, whether and if you answer, you've already answered it to a fair degree. Is it is it possible to use imagery input data of different resolutions? Um, and yes, you absolutely can. You did it in your project. There, this um, listener is particularly interested in combining say Sentinel uh, one data with a GUI imagery. Um, Yes, they can both be combined with an e-cognition, uh, like, like Charles has shown here. You may have to take into account uh, just some of the differences uh, in, in the two um, when, when creating, uh, say, a, a, some type of a classification uh, rule, but it, it is possible uh, to, to combine such. Uh, yeah, and I think he, you know, one thing you really like about e-cognition is, is the, the maps functionality, right? The fact that you can split off your data and sort of work with it at a different resolution at its native resolution and then integrate it back into your main map with your data at a higher resolution and we've had success um, making use of say landsat change um, not in urban areas because it's just too messy but in more sort of um, natural areas using landsat to help us identify areas of change and then going in and based on those areas using the high resolution data to actually do the change mapping because the high resolution data due to the parallax we end up actually sometimes with just imagery alone identifying way too much change so having moderate resolution data really cues us in on those areas where perhaps forested stands have been removed and been replaced with something else but in terms of actually then doing a feature extraction then we can go higher and you guys do such a good job with e-cognition and allowing data varying resolutions to be integrated um, and classified within a simultaneous workflow or in some cases partitioned out and handled separately before bringing it back in. Another question here on uh, this one is directly as on how you delivered the, um, the results that you had. Uh, did you go with a, a vector or a raster format um, in this project? The answer there is PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> And I'm not joking, is that is that I know it seems kind of sad because for these projects, 90 to 95 percent of the work is really, really nice remote sensing stuff. And then it really ends up in PowerPoints, like what people end up and what they're concerned with for decision making are some of the graphics and charts that I showed you at the end, right? What are the heights of the trees that we're losing? if we want to try to preserve those. Um, but we also did deliver the data and actually we do both. We do both um, raster and vector because of course the raster data is a little bit quicker to display, um, but the vector data shows um, uh, more precision. Great. Another question came in here um, from a user. Uh, they're, uh, I guess, relatively new to the software, but uh, it's still nice to have you with us today. Um, and it, their question is um, whether they can feed in, um, they're, they're calling here, let me see if I interpret this correctly, multi parts of the data at, a, at one time into cognition. I'm going to interpret that that you you have um, multiple scenes that you're, you're trying to process uh, simultaneously with an e-cognition and whether that's possible. Uh, yes, you can. Um, as you can imagine, the, the, say the city of Boston is covered by uh, quite a tile uh, grid of not only of LIDAR, but also of imagery. And one of the real strengths of eCognition uh, as well is um, batch processing. So within eCognition server, you can take this, uh, this rule set and, uh, and queue it up to, uh, I don't know, uh, 100 images, 1,000 images, however many you have that are part of this analysis, and you simply have to tell your computer, here, here's my input data, here's the rule set to, to use for processing, um, and hit analyze, and it'll, it'll go through and, and grab these and, uh, and work through, through that batch. And uh, I know, Charles, if you're a, an eCognition server uh, user, and I'm sure this, this data went through that as well. 
Yeah, it did. Yeah. And um, uh, just in case you didn't catch it ahead of time, we use the point cloud tiling structure as the foundation. And then we're the other data, the imagery and the vector data sets are, are already sort of uh, in mosaic or merged, if you will. So that's how we approach it. But uh, Keith, you guys have done some nice stuff uh, integrating some new data loading capabilities um, into eCognition 10. So for that person who's new, you should definitely check that out because you have a lot of flexibility in how you handle that. Just keep in mind that when you go to object-based approaches and you're generating image objects, you do have to partition your data down to a manageable size. And then as soon as you go to deep learning, you've got to make it even, even smaller in size. Typically, folks are using sort of 256 by 256 pixels for, for deep learning. And that's another reason I think why eCognition does things well is that in some cases, deep learning, especially for features such as wetlands that require more context associated with them, um, deep learning approaches where you have to partition your data into smaller tiles may not be as effective because you begin to lose the context of a scene that you could retain using perhaps an expert system or a traditional, more traditional classification and regression tree approach. Right, it's gonna take a couple more here. We, we might go a little bit over our hour, but hopefully uh, if you folks out there will forgive me. Um, another user here, Jarlath, maybe you can speak to this. Um, also a real world scenario, we don't always have uh, elevation data available to us. Um, would, they're working in say a, a Saharan area um, and, and Africa, and they find that they're getting a lot of confusion between uh, trees and, and grass, um, just based on, on say the, the pure color and reflectance. Do you have any tips on how you might differentiate between those two classes? Yeah, we uh, and and I haven't worked in sub-Sahara area, but we had a similar issue uh, mapping uh, land cover here in the United States and telling the difference between agricultural fields that were transitioning to shrub that had been sort of let go and those that were active. And what we found is those with shrubs had tiny, tiny little dark areas and we actually couldn't see the shrubs. You could see the shadows from the shrubs. So I always tell people to come back to the elements of image interpretation and what is what to you as a human makes that feature distinguishable? So I'm wondering if in your case, maybe how you tell that there's trees there instead of grass, are there shadows? So you actually don't want to map the trees per se, you actually want to map the shadows because that's the indication that the tree is there. And then that tree object is probably just offset in one direction from that shadow. So I hope that hopefully that gives you some insight and in perhaps how you can look for those small dark features on the landscape that maybe indicative indicative of the feature that you're looking to map. I might just add on to that some some of the, the experience I've had um, uh, was also working in parts of the world where we didn't have the, the luxury of, of elevation data at the time was um, also consider the the texture um, that these objects may have trees uh, depending on the, on the types of trees will typically have a rougher texture than that uh, smooth uh, grassy field uh, Although in your environment, uh, I'm not uh, uh, completely familiar with the, the Saharan regions of the world, um, but also something to think about there. One other question here, uh, I'm, I'm gonna maybe let Jarlath answer this because it could be biased from my side as the uh, say a developer of, of the eCognition software, but we have also a new person on the line and they're just uh, wondering, curious about how some of the segmentation uh, tools within eCognition, some of these, uh, Jarlath, you, you pointed out the refinement tools that are very strong in eCognition. How does, uh, say, a, a software like eCognition compare to uh, other softwares uh, that are on the market? And um, I'll, I'll, be curious, no pressure on you. You can certainly uh, give us grief if you if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know. I think one of the downsides of the object-based approach is that we've people have become obsessed with segmentation, and segmentation is such a small part of our workflow. Obviously, it's the foundation. If we don't have objects, then we don't have anything. But I think there's some real advantages to eCognition. One, pixel-based algorithms, right? So we can generate things like slope from lidar. We can difference the rasters within eCognition, we can run point cloud classifiers. All of that can be done within a single software package, which really streamlines our workflow. The other thing is not only does eCognition have multiple segmentation routines, which I think are probably just as good as 
MATLAB or whatever else you want to go to your, for your segmentation. But the interface is designed in a way that makes it intuitive for you to interpret and understand your data. And particularly in our case, where we're working with these different data sets, the time that it takes to visualize the data in a poorly designed software package would be ruinous for us. We just don't have the time to go to our GIS software package to look at something and come back to the feature extraction software package. And on top of that, we've got a bank of algorithms in eCognition, everything from classification to morphology algorithms, even to vectorization algorithms that allow us to uh, effectively work with the data set really from end to end. And I think it's difficult to find anything out there that really incorporates any other software package that incorporates all of those features. Great, didn't disappoint me there. And uh, I think on that note, I'll just uh, wrap up the question and answer. If we didn't get to your question here, um, please, you can contact us anytime. Uh, great. Uh, uh, a great source of, of information is uh, just ask our support team. So here are the address, support at ecognition.com. Uh, but in the in the next uh, slide here, uh, we also have lots of ecognition resources available out there uh, to you. And we've been working on these in parallel to our software. So uh, go to the ecognition community. There was a question earlier about uh, can they find examples, maybe rule sets that um, will walk them through certain types of processing. Uh, we have in our eCognition community a whole uh, library and tutorial section. Go there. There are demonstration projects. You can download rule sets and um, see how they work and get a really good impression of how uh, certain concepts um, are set up by, uh, in our case, some of, the, some of the pros that are creating these rule sets. Uh, social media. Uh, we're out. We're very busy, active in and LinkedIn. You can join the eCognition group. Stay tuned on all the the latest and greatest. We're always updating this with tips and tricks within the software. Like I mentioned earlier, eCognition TV. Uh, we have um, our webinars are obviously all hosted here, so you can you can view them there afterwards. But there's also a very good section uh, we call eCognition Deconstructed, where we go into depth on on specific algorithms. You can you can watch that and learn how a lot of these great refinement tools work. I believe the say the algorithm of the month um, here is the um, automatic thresholding algorithm. So uh, check that up. I, I certainly learned a lot uh, when when I. When I watched that. It's one that I wasn't using too often in, in my world. So uh, go there, you'll learn something new every day. Uh, like I said, again, eCognition support. Uh, you can ask uh, these folks too uh, certain questions if, if you're beating your head in other areas. Um, we have the eCognition blog. Um, please stay tuned there. If anybody's out doing cloud processing, check out the, uh, the latest blog post on how to get, uh, move your server uh, in, into uh, cloud environments. Never forget the documentation. Um, we're always linking uh, some of our latest and greatest videos to this. We're updating this constantly, so um, please take a look there. And webinars. Uh, this is uh, yeah, our last webinar of the year here, but we're looking forward already to 2021, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be getting out some news uh, as we roll into January on what our, our webinar will be uh, for that month. Right now, it's still uh, to be determined. If you have any ideas, any wishes on webinars, go to the eCognition community. Um, give us a post. Go to that wish list. You can uh, you can also tell us, hey, I'd like to really like to see a webinar on on this topic, and uh, we can we can certainly do our best to uh, to meet that uh, that wish. And of course, uh, training. <laughs> In the world that we're living in now, it's very difficult to do these on-site trainings, but you can uh, certainly uh, go and uh, we have uh, online trainings available and also take advantage of uh, some of the free training material that's available on eCognition TV. Uh, there's one for some of those new users that we're attending today. Uh, there's some, some specific uh, videos for new users. All those videos come uh, with, if you then go to the community, you can download the data packs and the rule sets that go along and accompany those. So you can walk through the video and, and use the software at the same time. Uh, so in, in all in all, we have a, have a very complete offering out there and uh, we'll continue to grow this over over the over the next uh, year that being said um i'd like to uh, first of all thank uh, jarlath for taking time at uh, it's always a busy time of the year uh, i know you're wrapping up the semester uh, there at uvm you're moving in and out of of the office uh, continue it feels like this year so thank you very much for uh, presenting uh, this today 
I, I really enjoyed it and I hope the audience did too. And um, yeah, thank everybody that, that attended today and we will see you next year. Um, so go out, uh, enjoy your holidays, come back fresh and uh, invigorated to use eCognition and, uh, and we'll see you. Have a good, uh, good rest of your day. Thank you very much.